<laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay, amazing. I can hear myself twice. So no pressure at all from Dave there. Thank you, Dave. Um, I know we're really stretched for time, so I'm going to go zooming through this as fast as I can, okay? So the talk is called AMP, Fastest Thing on the Internet. So it's a bit of a sensationalistic, clickbaity title. I apologize for that. My purpose was to try and attract the right people. If you care about performance and you don't know about, about AMP, then I want this talk to be for you. So I'm just curious. I, I mean, I'll, I'll assume everyone is very interested in, in performance, but who knows about AMP? OK, quite a few people, probably more than half. That's much more than I was expecting, so this is great. Now, uh, my name is Sanjay Baswani. Uh, I used to work extensively in AMP in the past. Uh, I worked at Compare the Market. Um, I worked on AMP Solutions. I did open source. I wrote about it and spoke about it and everything. And then I transitioned into a lot of JavaScript work. And for all of this year, I've been working uh, as a contractor in React, and I'm now working in Sky. Uh, and uh, I haven't touched AMP in quite a while. So when this opportunity came up, I thought, great, you know, this, this will give me a chance to re-familiarize myself with it as well. And so what, what I've discovered is that, uh, that's a great accessible button there. I don't know if you'll notice that, Bruce. <laughs> but what I've discovered in my time dealing, working alongside people who don't really know much about AMP or haven't worked in it extensively is that I find a lot of situations in business where or in our day-to-day -day work where I think that actually AMP could solve something here, or there'll be something in AMP that should be part of the discussion. Maybe it shouldn't be what we go for, but it's hard to find a common starting ground. So that's why I want this to be, just like a really quick high-level primer that just skims all across the whole landscape, right, and gives us a bit of an idea of what to look for and what we're dealing with. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can follow along uh, 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 with the talk there, sanj.io slash amp talk, and you don't have to take pictures or notes or anything. You can just go visit that later on. So what are we talking about? So this is an example of like what AMP might give us. This is one example. So let's say you've done a search for a content topic. You'll get a bit of placement. AMP can take you places where non-AMP pages can't go. It can help you get a little bit higher up there. It can help you get a lot of performance. And most importantly, on the web, uh, it can help you get really, really fast uh, page load time. So typically, you would see on like a good uh, web page, you might expect like something like six to 12 seconds typically, somewhere in that range on like good 3G. With AMP, if you follow all the rules, you can get something like one to one and a half second page load times. And that's a massive boost, right? You can't, you can't argue with that. On the flip side, AMP is also slightly <laughs> controversial. So this is something. <laughs> Thank you for your reaction. I really didn't know what to expect. So on the flip side, like, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot with AMP in the past, and it's always talking about the good sides or how to get people into it. I don't think anyone's really talked about the, the controversy openly or like discussed you know, uh, what the good, uh, bad, and the ugly sides are. So I'm going to try and do that as well. So if we start from the beginning, let's take a typical scenario. Our user does a search. They, unbeknownst to them, they're going through search or whatever discovery. Unbeknownst to them, something is preloading that AMP page in the background. So as soon as they click it, when compared to a non-AMP page, that's going to load instantly because we've already done all the work for them. Now, this isn't like breaking news. Like you'll see a lot of these are case studies off of Google's own website. Uh, AMP has been around. It's been open source. It's been around for nearly four years since, since 2015. Um, the last metric we have from Google is from almost two years ago when they uh, told us there was about 25 million domains using AMP and 4 billion AMP pages. That's two years ago, and that was exponential growth from the year before, and I wouldn't be surprised if that growth has continued. We also know that AMP makes up now about 0.1% of the discoverable web. And if you're a higher traffic site, you're much more likely to have a higher AMP presence, and 80% of high traffic US sites do have a majority of an AMP presence. So like I said, this all started in 2015. That was the same year that uh, Apple News came out and Facebook Instant Articles came out. So Google wanted to be a part of this movement as well. And that's where we have this. So this is their mission statement. Now, the most important one I'm going to pull out there on the left is that user experience trumps developer experience, trumps ease of implementation. Now, we probably all have a lot of conversations about how we can optimize our code, how we can do performance better, 
but really those conversations always kind of involve us. Like, how are we going to be still happy with it? How is it still going to work OK in our code base? With AMP, they throw all that out the window, and they only think about user experience first. So we'll look at some of the building blocks that we have. Firstly, like, it's sort of like HTML web component, if you're not familiar with it. So on the right, you can see there we have like, uh, like a list, we have a carousel, we're getting some data, we're iterating over, we have an image. And the way that that works is that, firstly, in the top left there, we'd have to load the AMP runtime. That's sort of the brains of the whole operation that manages resources, knows about critical viewports and things like that. And then for each of the uh, components that we wanted to use, we would have to use like a corresponding uh, uh, AMP tag, uh, sorry, a script tag, a script that brings in that component. Now, there's a lot of components. They're open source. You can contribute to them. You can like, open uh, issues. You can, uh, you can ask other people to fix them. You can suggest brand new ones as well. And in the past, what I've done is, now, these components aren't meant to be used on their own. They are meant to be used on top of the AMP runtime. But in the past, I have used them as standalones. Like, I needed a carousel or a light box, and I thought, you know, screw it. I'll try it, see what happens. And it's worked OK. It's not fully supported. And the future plan is for something called Bento AMP, where they're going to allow you to use these components standalone, so you won't need the runtime. And the intention there, I think, is to give us a way to, let's say, pick a component, and then we don't want to worry about development for, for, uh, for the future. We don't want to worry about keeping that uh, up to date with what's the most performant way of doing things. They'll worry about that. We just follow the API. So now we know about all the building blocks that we have, the sort of Lego. That's cool, but then that doesn't give, get us all of the benefits of AMP. We have to follow the rules to have like a valid AMP page. So there's like, it's a little cut off. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for the screen size. But on the left, you'll see there's just a little bit of boilerplate that goes in our markup. On the right, you can see the three sort of main major rules. Some HTML is not allowed, mainly the ones that uh, would load resources, like video, image, uh, and so on. Uh, there are CSS restrictions. Ultimately, uh, the final output of your CSS has to be in one inline script uh, style tag at the head of the page. Uh, how it gets there, that's kind of up to you. There are other restrictions as well, like you can't target some of their built-in elements, you can't use important in some cases, and there's size restrictions as well. Like, really, that size restriction like, won't become a problem for most people. It's only if you're delivering CSS that like 80 or 90% of it isn't being on a use, uh, used on a page, then you're going to like, have a problem. The biggest one is custom JavaScript res restrictions. You're not, you're not allowed the script tag in there, and you're not allowed until now, really, any custom JavaScript. So that was always the biggest problem. And you're probably asking, well, that's, that's quite a big problem. And it, and it is. So there have been good, good ways of solving interactivity in there. Again, I'm really, I'm really sorry you can't see it there. But at the top, like, we just have a way of maintaining state. And then the middle there, you've just got a button that has like an, it captures an event, and it can fire something off to the runtime. Uh, and then at the bottom there, you'd have like a binding. So like, uh, state events and bindings. That's like a pattern that probably most people are really familiar with. We can do that uh, in AMP. We can use iframes. We can use AMP install service worker, which is pretty good. It ties in very well with like the PWA ecosystem. And there's even something ridiculous called a PWAMP, a progressive web AMP. Uh, but the really nice thing about the AMP service worker is it gives you one line, uh, one line uh, offline capability. So one line of code, and you'll give all users 100% offline capability. Like about a month or so ago, they actually finally released this AMP script. So now you can write custom JavaScript in your AMP pages. The issues are obviously that, uh, again, there's, there's, there's some restrictions. I mean, uh, if you're interested, you can go check it out. But basically, you're restricted to about 150 kilobytes of JavaScript on the page. So you won't be able to use jQuery, React, and Angular all bundled in you know, to give you like a nice button. Um, all of your interactions. <laughs> Anything, anything that changes the layout due to an interaction has to happen uh, only within the scope of this DOM. Uh, there's a few other things, but it's, it's pretty good. We're getting there, I think. Now, if you follow all those rules, great. Now you've got a valid AMP page. So in the bottom left there, you've got your code that you've shipped off to your domain. And then on the right there, the bottom right there, you've got an AMP cache. So that's like basically a CDN that will host your page if it's a valid AMP page. Traditionally, it used to only be Google, but now Cloudflare and Bing 
also provide CDN. So you don't have to opt into one ecosystem. You could use all of them or pick the one that you like. And then the final bit of magic is the viewer that sits above that. So if our user is hitting our app cache page and they're coming via the viewer, they're going to get that preload kind of experience. The app viewer, as well as everywhere, everything else in the app ecosystem, is open source. So it'll forever be there to extend and reuse for anyone that wants to. That app viewer now, again, like probably a year or two ago, it was only in Google domains, but now it's everywhere. Uh, and it's being adopted in like quite a big way. And that's the thing that's doing all that magical preloading and stuff. And what it's technically doing in, in uh, Google search is it's loading those preloaded pages into uh, an iframe. Uh, but because the runtime manages the resources, you don't actually load any resources until you navigate to the page. So this is an example of what that would look like. So you've done a search for something. In this case, uh, uh, it's, like a, uh, it's like something that gets a content hit. In the top there, you'll see the top news stories or the top stories carousel. So if you're valid that page, you get presence in there. And you get this kind of like slightly native um, native mobile kind of experience on the web or in your browser. Uh, apart from content, uh, commerce, e-commerce is the big other industry that they've tried to conquer. And this, uh, this is an example of AliExpress. And this is like a fully featured end-to-end, 100% -end, app experience where you can go shop and, and buy something, add it to your cart, check out, and do all that. They've been using uh, AMP for quite a long time, and it's doing quite well for them. Uh, it's not only content and e-commerce, so com compare the market where I used to work. This is an example of me doing a uh, search, and there are some AMP and non-AMP pages. The AMP page loads like really quick. It gives you a whole bunch of stuff, lets you do whatever you want to do. You can sign in, you can go get your car insurance quote, so on. And then you'll see there on the right is the little gray AMP logo. Now that's the thing that in uh, top stories and in search sort of denotes you're going to click on an AMP page. And about I think two years ago, Google came out with their own research to say they're tracking something like a 0.1 to 0.5% increased chance that a user is going to click on that. And there's a link in there. If you, if you visit the site later, you can click on the Read More link, um, where there's uh, a case study from Womp Mobile that was earlier this year that's, that says that they're seeing something like 5 to 11% higher chance that someone's going to click on a link in a given situation if they see the AMP logo, because they've become used to the fact that they're going to get a fast page. So that's kind of like a gist of what AMP is. You have AMP websites at the top there. You have AMP stories. That's a really cool new like visual storytelling kind of format. There's AMP ads, if that's your world. And AMP email is very cool as well. So this is not really performance. This is just kind of bringing email into like the modern age with like interactivity and stuff. Again, it's available on uh, Gmail. It's available on mail.ru. It's also available on Outlook now. Great. So now we've talked about all like the good stuff. We know a little bit about what AMP is. Now let's talk about some of the issues with it. So if you did like sentiment analysis out there online, I think you would find people were net quite negative about AMP if, uh, if they knew about it at all. Um, and I'm not, I'm not really 100% sure why that is. Uh, I'm not trying to advocate for it or against it. I would just like to present all the information so that we can make an informed choice. The Verge, which I really like, um, they do a lot of really great tech stuff. They seem to be very against AMP. And this is a really awesome interview that uh, I think Nilay Patel himself did it with Malte Ubel from uh, Google. This is maybe about a year or so ago. This was the, maybe the first time that in like a really massive online kind of arena, they were sort of held to, held to task and asked some tough questions like, if it wasn't for Google's backing, would AMP sort of be here? You, know? um, you can read all about that on the Verge's AMP site. <laughs> Uh, and then there's also a lot of other really constructive criticism. Like this one, this, this is probably one of the first big movements that came out after AMP sort of to, started to really sort of gain popularity. Um, this, this letter itself has like maybe seven or 800 signatories now. So, and it's not, it, it's quite constructive. It, it offers some, you know, uh, some, it offers some, it offers some criticism about what uh, AMP is and what could be doing differently, and it also suggests some alternatives. 
Um, mainly that app gets so much preference, but we have ways of measuring it and creating really performance sites now, so why not give all of those performance sites the same preference? This is another one from Andrew Betts. Uh, so he inadvertently ended up suggesting a spec for the web standards, which the app now uses to do something called signed exchanges, which kind of lets you lets a, a CDN deliver you uh, an AMP page from their own domain, but pretending to be from the original domain. Um, one of the main points in this article is this sort of self-inflicted coercion that we're sort of going through because we're seeing all the success for everyone else. We'd sort of be crazy not to use it ourselves, right? And one of the other problems is that it is, it is very successful. So it, it has been involved in a little bit of misinformation and uh, misuse in the past. There are some links there. I'm, I don't have time to go into it right now. Um, it's not all wine and roses. Like I said, not everyone sees a boost. Uh, compared to the market, I think we saw something like a 90 to 95% success chance on a page that we converted to AMP to see an uplift. And in most cases, like really massive up uplifts, like double digit boosts. But that still means in five to 10% of the cases, really oddly, we were seeing like uh, uh, little negative effects. And they exist as well, but I think you know, that sort of comes, comes down to you know, the implementation itself. Whatever you're replacing with your AMP version, something's gone wrong there. And it may be AMP's fault, it may be the technology's fault, it may be the business's fault for not giving us people enough time, maybe our fault for not delivering enough. Google as well uh, are kind of aware that there's this big pushback uh, against AMP and there's this sort of negative sentiment around it. So they're trying to sort of debunk some of these myths and there's this page here which you can go and check out if you want. Uh, the main one is that, uh, the main few are that this is like a Google thing. It started off as a Google thing and it's like totally open source now. So there's lots of other individuals and companies involved in maintaining and progressing this forward. And that uh, one of the other big myths is that this is only for the mobile web. It isn't, it's for all web experiences everywhere now and it's for email, so on, so on. Uh, a couple of other points I'm going to raise is that there in the top right, in the bottom right, sorry, when we're in the app cache, when we're in a CDN, we're on someone else's domain, either Google's, Cloudflare's, or Bing's. So suddenly our first party cookies become third party cookies. Now, that's a big stumbling block. There are ways around it, and they give us solutions, but it's not perfect and it's not super pretty. If you're that AMP viewer that's preloading all those pages, those are tens or hundreds of kilobytes of extra data that's being shifted down the line. Also, that page that we've built ourselves that is not an AMP page can actually be more performant than the AMP version itself, but not in the AMP cache. Uh, those are the AMP components that we saw. That's a lot of components, right? How do you begin to find what you want? And the problem is what they want to do with Bento AMP to give us one component to use forever, one API, they won't be versioning that. So as they keep adding to it and changing it, the, the version will stay the same. So we don't yet know what's going to happen down the line. Uh, implementation, not super easy, but we've got a few choices now. Uh, Gatsby's got a good plugin. If you're in the WordPress ecosystem, you've got a lot of great choices. And Next now uh, has first class support for AMP using React, and that's what this is built in. This is an AMP story written with Next uh, in React, uh, and it's a valid AMP page on that site. Uh, this is about the technical steering committees that Google have now. So Google have opened up to say there are advisory committees that you can join to sort of become a, a part of the AMP process. Uh, and you can go check that out if you're interested. This is a blog from someone who did join and he doesn't really like AMP, so he's trying to do what he can to sort of push it into the right direction. It's really nice that the, the sort of ecosystem is open to all that. And awesome, last slide. So the final thing I'll, I'll say is that we are not our users. We may look and sound and act like our users, but we're actually very different. We experience our web experiences, the things that we built, very differently to the way that our users do. And the billions of data points that we have kind of suggest that they like what AMP is doing. So I will leave you with that. I will say that that was a lot of information. It was very fast, and I really skimmed over a lot. Thank you for listening. But I hope you now know a little bit more and uh, can sort of make that judgment yourself if it's a good or bad idea. Thank you.